everyone, and welcome to another Things We Said Today, our weekly roundtable of Beatles happenings and news all over the world, past, present, and future. I'm Steve Marinucci, writer for Billboard.com and Access.com, and let me introduce you to my three cohorts. First up in the, is it snowy there, Alan? In the snowy uh, confines of Maine, uh, our musicologist uh, who has who was well known for the Beatles desk at the New York Times and, and now writes for the Wall Street Journal and numerous other publications and is author of, I don't have my introduction. Oh, the, the Beatles from the cavern to the rooftop and uh, yep. what was it? Got that something, how yep. the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Alan Posen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And coming from Connecticut, um, the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. How's it going? I'm doing well. And coming to us from the great state of Pennsylvania, our legendary, <laughs> legendary, legendary, oh, legendary uh, Beatles executive editor um, and the author of uh, He'll Tell Me. Changing time. <laughs> <laughs> Changing times, 101 days that shaped the generation. Here we go. Um, Mr. Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. Uh, I got to keep it loose. I'm sorry. Um, and joining us this week, we have a very special guest, the author of a recently released book. It's not. I wouldn't. I don't think it's brand. It's not brand new, um, but a recently released book um, documenting. The History of the Beatles in Canada, and that's the title. Mr. Piers Hemingen. Hemingson, yeah. Hemingson, there we go. Yeah. Welcome, Hello. welcome. Thank you. Hi, Piers. All the way from Hi, Canada. Piers. All the way from Canada. And we got a couple of um, news things to talk about uh, at the beginning of the show. The biggest thing, and the thing that broke last night as we are taping this on a Monday, is that Ringo posted pictures of him in the studio with uh, Paul McCartney and Joe Walsh. And he's also posted other people in the past few days, but the Paul McCartney pictures really set off a, a major a social media storm and resulted in a story I wrote on, on Billboard.com this morning and... Also, I mean, what do you guys – do you guys have any comments about this? Nope. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand why people get excited about Paul and Ringo working together. First of all, they're together all the time. You know, it's not like it's rare that they're – that they either appear together or work together. They're, they're together all the time, and so it's not – you know, it's not anything rare, and it's not a Beatles reunion because uh, there can't be a Beatles reunion right. with without two others. Right. And uh, you know, yeah. so I I don't understand why people make such a big deal if they see a picture of Paul and Ringo together. You it's, know, to be to be honest, to be honest, I think it's because the two of them together work. I hate to say work better together than separately, but. Maybe that's not so far afield to say that. I mean, well, I mean look at uh, – I mean, Ken, what, what do you have to say? I, I definitely don't agree with that statement. I mean, they've made great music together, and they've made great music apart. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is because they were both part of the greatest band of all time, anything they do together makes news. Well, that's, that, that's, that's, that's very true, too. So in this particular case, Paul showed up because he's adding a bass part to uh, one of Ringo's songs. I don't know if there's any more involvement for Ringo's next album. So you see a photo of the two of them together, and it makes a splash all over social media. And, you know, it's nice to see the two of them together. I, they are together quite often. They don't, yeah. work, they don't work together all the time. No. This is the first time since Ringo's Why Not album that Paul right. will be on it. So he's made several albums since then. So it's not like he's on every single album. It's nice to see the two of them together. And, and they've done you know, they've done live stuff since 
that. So you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's nice, and it reminds us that Ringo has an album coming out um, due sometime this year, and now we know that Paul will be on it, and when we have tracks to hear, we'll have something to say. Yeah, right. Pretty right. much. And when, when you look at the list of all the people that apparently are on Ringo's album, they're some of the same people that have been on Ringo's most recent albums. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. if you follow what he's been doing and you like the work that he's been doing with these musicians, like Steve Lukather, you know, we heard last year that Richard Marks is supposed to be on it, Peter Frampton's supposed to be on it, those people, then it's going to be uh, probably similar, and maybe there'll be some new additions of people he hasn't worked with. So, right. um you know, uh, he just basically grabs anybody that he can grab and and you know gets them to to play with him. So, you know, you kind of never know what's going to come up. But um, well, he yeah. he he he's kind of on record of saying that he basically right. that anybody that comes by the house, pretty much, you know, if they're a musician, they're gonna they're gonna you know. <laughs> Get a pair of headphones put on them and an instrument put in their hands and uh, and you know participate. Yeah, but I think it's the excitement of of the two of them doing but, something together. But there's that, no excitement because oh, it's I not, disagree. I it's disagree. Not, it's not the Beatles. I disagree. It's, look at look at the. I mean, look at how quickly who that. Who cares? Who cares? What a bunch of idiots. A lot of people. Social, a lot of uh, Al. A bunch that, of idiots photo, on social media. Who that cares? photo tweeted? That photo tweeted like crazy. Or who was, cares? Al, you're probably the only Al? one that doesn't, because a lot of people do, and it, it and if Billboard and Rolling Stone cover it. And not only, I mean, not, not only Billboard and Rolling Stone, but I mean, if Billboard and Rolling Stone cover this. But what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's not like it's the, it's not the Beatles. It's no, not it's the not. Beatles They're, getting together. Said, no, it's, said two, it it's the two surviving right. ex-Beatles right. getting well, together for the, reason, the first time in about two years, which is. <laughs> but the reason why <laughs> it's getting all this coverage is for that very same reason. Because it's the two Beatles together. It's the two that we have left. And there are a lot of people out there who cling on to their memories right. of the Beatles and think very highly, hey, look, go back to the year 2010 when Ringo played at Radio City Music Hall for his 70th birthday. He had a great band, as he always does in the All-Stars. All you heard about... That night was that Paul McCartney was there. That well, was like, different. That was that, that was different. Exactly. He was he was playing uh, the two of them together on stage live, playing "Birthday" and you know actual. And it was also and, also a surprise too. Yeah, I mean, that was a, right? so. Yeah. Plus, plus, yeah, I was there, so it made it. And I was automatically there important. There you go. <laughs> there, there you go, guys. There you but go. that but that will get more attention than anything else, sure. because it's the two of them, and that's right. the way the media handle it because. They're both part of the greatest band ever. Whether right. you like it or not, that's how the media handles it. It's news. I mean, as 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 you said, and as my editor at Billboard said, it's news. It's so stupid. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, that's, it's not. that's because we in the media are the enemy of the people, and we like to <laughs> well, push that's these things. <laughs> there you go, Alan. Yes, you're you're correct. We are. So um, on to other okay. news. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Um, we lost another. Well, we've lost actually. Two people that have Beatle connections, one more than the other. The first one would be uh, the artist Alan Aldridge, who anyone with the book, um, the Beatles Illustrated Lyrics, uh, knows uh, of his work. But he also did work. I mean, he did the uh, the artwork for the uh, the Elton John Captain Fantastic. He did its only rock and roll for the Stones. He's done. Uh, he, he's put out all sorts of artwork, and and he did some great. You know, those great psychedelic artwork way back when, and it was really sad to hear about that. Um, anybody have a comment about that? Great artist. In fact, I remember mm. a few years ago I gave away, and you mentioned it in your article, Steve, um, <laughs> something that came out called A Beatles Illustrated Collective Set, which <laughs> was uh, an 18-month calendar with his artwork. And um, accompanying that was a vinyl, well, I guess 45. <laughs> Was it a vinyl or was it a CD? Because I have mine and I, I haven't opened it. I have a vinyl one, and it's it's all covers of Paul McCartney songs. So 
you know, I was given that away on my website. The one I have is uh, um, has McCartney and Beatles. So yeah. well, maybe it's well, a CD version. But right. I combined. think the one one classic image of his um, that that you see a lot is the, the Beatles as old men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. that's uh, it's like if. You kind of, especially now, you know, you look at it and you think, I, I, I sort of, you know, wish it had turned out so that we could see that mm. picture live. But yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right. That's a that's a good point. Alan. But it was a good projection, you know. Yeah, and then the third piece of news uh, that just broke today, in fact, I, I guess within the past couple of hours, is um, guitarist Larry Coryell has passed away, which uh, he did um, some Beatle covers. He was on. Guitar tribute to the Beatles, uh, Volume One, doing something, and there's a there's a version on YouTube if you search of him doing uh, "She's Leaving Home," mm-hmm. and I have not like I have not heard that album for a long time. So, but uh, that was a it was a very uh, diverse album, and there was some really good stu- stuff on there. I do remember that they put out there was actually two ver- or two volumes they put out separately, but. Alan, you were saying that you actually – you met him. Um, yeah, I, I did a, a radio interview once that he – where he was a guest and it was a, a bunch of guitarists in different um, genres. Uh, the other one who was there I remember was um, Sharon Isbin, classical guitarist. I think possibly Carlos Bobo Salima too. And um, in this show, they – you know, we, we talked to all of them and they all played – together larry coriel was just i mean he was he was an incredible guitarist he was he was professionally a jazz guitarist but he studied classical guitar and he did this kind of jazz rock fusion thing that uh you know it's sort of in the same sort of school of thought as someone like john mclaughlin you know i mean Mm -hmm. and he and he was just a, a a great great player i mean the beatles connection is a little peripheral because he he did some covers and that was it uh but and uh i'm not sure if we talked about the beatles when i talked to him i mean this was in probably the 80s so long long ago but um yeah you know yet another musician loss uh this week, so it's it's uh, it's a pity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let's get to the uh, let's get to the the main part of the show. We have a special guest uh, today, uh, Mr. Piers Hem. I'm going to do that again. Hemmingson. Thank yes. you. I'm trying to read my writing too. That's that, that's not a good thing. Piers, welcome to the show. Thank you. You have, and as we said, you have a book called uh, "The Beatles in Canada." Which pretty much says what it's about, and the way Canada found the Beatles was a little similar to to what happened with America. But Canada had uh, a little. There were some different reasons why the Beatles uh, got picked up in Canada. What what were they? I'll just go back to one one thing about the book. The book came out last year. I call it the Red Book because it it covers up and until September of 1964. The follow-up, the Blue Book, which I'm working on now, will take it right to the end, 1970. But to answer your question, the Canadian Beatles story is is different from the American Beatles story at the beginning, but it is very mm-hmm. similar all the way through. You know, there are obviously some differences, but it's a similar story. And... Uh, uh, the main differences, I think, have to do with the political uh, ties that that Canada had with uh, the United Kingdom in the 1950s into the early 1960s. Uh, there was a lot of people traffic. Uh, usually one way uh, people emigrated from the United Kingdom, they wanted to get away from uh, rationing in the late 50s. It was a pretty miserable existence compared to North America. So Mm. Canada was one place where they took a lot of, I guess, people emigrating from the United Kingdom. The people who were there uh, typically had choices. They could choose between Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, and they would generally have to apply and go through a lot of paperwork. And eventually, once their paperwork was approved, they would take a one-way ship to, uh, in this case, Canada. So there was a lot of one-way people traffic. Uh, Capital Records always uh, 
the Beatles label in North America uh, was headquartered in Los Angeles. In the 50s, uh, it was purchased by EMI uh, circa 1955. And I think that was a very significant uh, event because uh, Capital of Canada would have access to some recordings out of their uh, parents' parent, if you will, you know, in, in England, that was more suitable for release in Canada than it would have been in the United States due to the demographics, i.e. there were a lot of expatriate English people living in Canada who wanted to buy records by uh, British artists like Freddie Gardner, the saxophonist from the United Kingdom who had some wartime hits. They wouldn't have sold one of those records in the States. I believe he, his stuff was issued there on Columbia and, mm -hmm. and the odd one on DECA, but they didn't do much. But up, up here, uh, they did very well in numbers. It's all relative, of course. But mm. uh, to answer your question, I think that really made the difference as to why the Beatles took off in Canada in 1963 instead of February of 1964, you know, with the Ed Sullivan show in the States. I was watching that show, of course, and it was an amazing show. I'd seen the Beatles on television when I lived in England the year before when they had Please Please Me on the charts. Canada did not have any televised Beatles segments during 1963, but we had news segments. So they did make the news, the radio, the records were played on the radio. She Loves You charted at number one in late 1963. And Canada, you know, the capital subsidiary had the first album in North America, which was obviously the second British album with the Beatles. They just added the word Beatlemania to the front of it. But, you know, singles, albums, circa December 1963 were the hottest thing in Canada. Mm -hmm. You also got the um, the Ringo version of Love Me Do that nobody else got, that uh, that uh, America didn't get. Well, that, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. And, and when I did the research for the book, I kind of concluded that the original master tape that was lost probably ended up in Canada. And at the end of the book, I do have the, the circle closing where I bring back the, uh, the Canadian version back to Abbey Road. And one of the engineers there, his name was Sean, he, uh, he took that, that master for posterity and made a new one out of it. But uh, it was definitely the, the Ringo version on drums that was issued in Canada. I have to be honest, when I looked at sales figures from February of 1963, uh, you're talking about 200 copies of that record selling across 3,000 miles. So it wasn't a large seller. Was that the, was, when you say you brought it to Abbey Road, was that for the, did that end up on the Beatles Rarity album? Is that, is that where that ended up or was that after well, that? Probably uh, after, right? Because on the Rarities album, on the notes, they say that they actually took it from a vinyl single. Mm, right. So when when did you yeah, give the tape was, to them, Pierce? Was, well, uh, just a few years. I think it was 2014 mm. or 2000, yeah, 2014. Okay. You know, 20-odd years after the Rarity uh, record. But, you know, it, it's all different. Um, Canada had a fan club set up here in the fall of 1963, Canada's fan club would become the largest organized fan club outside of the United Kingdom. Uh, they had upwards of 100,000 members in the Toronto chapter at one stage. And when the Beatles came to do the Sullivan show, there was no organized U.S. fan club. They brought the two girls down from Toronto to uh, hang out with the Beatles at the Plaza Hotel. Uh, Deso Hoffman was a photographer with the entourage, he took their pictures sorting mail at the plaza with George and with Paul. I, I think you might have seen some of those pictures. But sure. Canada obviously had a, a minor role relative to Ed Sullivan. But there, there's obviously a lot of uh, detail in the book that I've prepared. But I'm just trying to summarize. Canada had uh, kids coming back from the United Kingdom with uh, Beatle records, turning on their friends. Uh, but the way the circle went here is that the radio station had to play the Beatles records for kids to hear them before the kids would go out and buy the records. So uh, it took a few radio stations in certain pockets in Canada to play records like She Loves You and From Me to You 
uh, before that, before kids would actually go out and buy the record. Uh, From Me to You, they got into a battle with Del Shannon Mm. uh, in in places like Winnipeg and Vancouver. The radio Mm. stations would have this thing called Battle of the Bands, and they would Mm -hmm. take the same song by two different artists, play them uh, back to back, and then have the phone lines open up and have kids vote as to which one they preferred. Uh, In Winnipeg, they preferred the Beatles over Del Shannon. In Vancouver, it was uh, Del Shannon that that uh, was the preferred mm. cover. So it, at the end of the day, it was She Loves You that, that became the number one song for the Beatles. By the time they stepped onto the stage at Ed Sullivan on, on February the 9th of 64, Canada already had two albums out. They had the Beatlemania album, and then they had almost the greatest hits for, for its time, was called Twist and Shout. So it took, took up some of the old tracks from Please Please Me, But it basically had all of their first four Canadian 45s right up to She Loves You. So for anybody that didn't sort of cotton on to the Beatles in 1963, they could buy that album and be totally up to date. And I know, you know, from my reading of the Bruce Spizer books and other books in the States, there was a a whole bunch of different companies like VJ and then Swan Mm -hmm. picked up on She Loves You. The mystery to me in my research was why Capital in Canada did not issue I Want to Hold Your Hand in December of 1963. And instead, they chose to issue uh, the two-sided uh, rollover Beethoven with Please Mr. Postman on the back. Uh, when they could, have, they could have had I Want to Hold Your Hand issued uh, in December of 63. I never could find out why that was other than I think they just had... Uh, the master tape for the album, and it was practiced back then to take a couple of cuts off the album and put them out as a single to get interest in the record, in the album. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Alan? Okay. Yeah, I was wondering um, if in your research you looked at, um, you you said, for instance, that Love Me Do sold 200, and and if you've charted, followed the record sales of the early singles, um, after that, how they how they spread across the different provinces of Canada? Where were they the strongest? And uh, you know, how did it did did you look at the the sales in different areas? Sure, I, I've got a whole chapter, and and the chapter has the charts from every major radio station across Canada. So I do break it out by city, and you can see which cities charted Beatles records at the beginning, and which obviously did not. So Toronto was a big Beatles center. London, Ontario was a big Beatles center. Ottawa, so a lot of Ontario cities. Winnipeg and Vancouver were the other two. Montreal was late, uh, partly because of the uh, bilingual aspect of Quebec. Mm -hmm. They didn't chart She Loves You. The first number one record in Montreal was Roll Over Beethoven, which turned out to be a huge hit in the discos of Montreal probably due to the beat of the music. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yes, I do go across Canada and even some of the smallest places, they got review copies of the records and Grand Prairie in Alberta, CFGP is the radio station. They were one of the first stations to chart Please Please Me in April of 63. And uh, I show the chart in the book. And largely, I believe that's because they could receive uh, the big Chicago station, I know it's Dick Biondi was the... Uh, WLS. The WLS. And I think a lot of these smaller stations would just tune into the big American stations and whatever they like, they would kind of break into their charts. So uh, I do go back to the beginning of rock and roll, as I mentioned, in Canada. And rock and roll was invented in the United States. Rock and roll came to Canada in the 50s over the airwaves from big radio stations like WKBW in Buffalo right. and um, mm-hmm. just in Chicago, where, where after the war they were investing in 50,000-watt transmitter towers when our biggest stations probably had 1,000 watts. So any uh, young teenager with a transistor radio would get loud and clear, you know, Tom Shannon from Buffalo, New York, all over Ontario, 
but they might not get their own lo local radio station as strong. And they were playing Beatles stuff. That's what they heard on the radio. So strong, strong American influence for sure. It's interesting that you know there was an American influence, and yet the Beatles, in a way, breaking in Canada earlier, showed that there was also some independence too. You know, um, yeah. Paul White was the A and R equivalent of uh, Dave Dexter Jr., and Paul was one of those people that emigrated from uh, the UK in the late fifties, and he was British, and he got a job at Capitol Records, and he started uh, releasing records that he felt would appeal to to uh, Canadians uh, as opposed to just issuing records by, you know, Capital L.A. in Canada, which they did, of course. I mean, Nat King Cole and Peggy Lee and the Kingston Trio were all popular here. But he was also able, with his own series of records, to issue things from England that he thought would have a chance in Canada. So he would issue, I mean, George Martin's uh, Ray Cathode 45 time beat got a, mm -hmm. on an issue on capital in Canada. Who bought it? I have no idea. <laughs> John Barry 7 with the James Bond theme, um, the Temperance 7, group, Helen Shapiro, all these uh, people who may may have not been picked up by capital in Los Angeles. Notably, I guess, uh, Frank Ifield wasn't picked. I mean, maybe one of his records before he was passed over to BJ. I'm not sure, but... Basically, Paul White was issuing everything that was charting in the UK that he thought would work in Canada. Mm -hmm. So after Love Me Do and its sale of 200, how did, the, how did the sales increase over the next few singles before February 64? Um, it's, it's safe to say that Love Me Do and Please Please Me were not big sellers uh, when they were initially uh, issued in Canada. Please Please Me came out just about the same time as uh, I'm thinking Please Please Me came out on VJ, correct, in the States? Mm -hmm. and, and I've checked with Bruce Spicer. The timings are very similar but between the Love Me Do in Canada and the Please Please Me on VJ. Uh, v, uh, Please Please Me in Canada wasn't issued until the beginning of April. It sold marginally more than Love Me Do, uh, but the record that really got some traction was not until June was From Me to You with Thank You Girl. Mm -hmm. Did you run into any records of um, wh how and whether the Canadian Beatles things were imported into the U.S. early on? I mean, we, do we hear about people, you know, bringing things over from England, but it, it seems like it would have been a bit easier to get them from Canada, you know, bring them right down. Uh, I got stories in the book that go the other way around, where, where people were actually bringing, you know, VJ records up to Canada. I don't know why, but they were gifts, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> when the Beatles took off, uh, there were two enterprising individuals, I believe, from it's either Philadelphia or Brooklyn. The details are in the book, but they 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 literally took a you know direct. Uh, flight or train to Toronto. They met with Capitol Records and they did a deal to take three singles that weren't issued in the States, Love Me Do, Roll Over Beethoven, and a third one called All My Loving. Uh -huh. And they uh, literally train carloads of these records to go down to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And the numbers we got from a search was, and speaking with Paul White, was something like 350,000 copies of each. Wow. And they, they started to chart on Billboard and I believe also on Cashbox in, in, I think, March of 1964. And they were, they were on the jukeboxes in the States. You could buy them. I have uh, documentary evidence in the book from someone who lived in Brooklyn who saw the records for sale. They were, they were charging, I think, 10 cents more per 45 for a Canadian mm. Capitol 45. Um, mm. But very quickly, I think uh, Capital in L.A. saw this as not a good thing. Mm. Uh, they put some pressure on the Toronto office to say, hey, what's going on? They, they denied they knew anything about it. But somebody must have known <laughs> to, to get that many records pressed uh, by our sister here and shipped down to... Uh, places like Chicago, where it was on the charts, and Philadelphia, New York. Somebody had to know something. 
Mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. I remember seeing Roll Over Beethoven in New York early on. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. th- those were, um, I wouldn't say plentiful, and we kind of knew that they weren't um, American. We probably even knew that they were Canadian. We'd heard of the place, you know. Um, <laughs> where, where you the it label? was a small print around the edge of the label. There was the word Canada, but it, it looked like a <laughs> an orange swirl. It looked like yeah, a beach. Yeah, yeah. Of product. Mm-hmm. Um, so She Loves You was the first number one. Do you, do you remember what that sold and, and, and when it hit number one there? Uh, I have the chart. It hit number one uh, December the 13th, 1963. Mm-hmm. A number one record back then, you know, if they did 25,000 copies, probably early December, by the end of the month into January, they were up to probably, uh, I think, 100,000 copies. That was a huge seller in Canada. So the numbers in Canada are nowhere near the numbers you have in the United States. So, for example, the biggest selling single of all time in the 60s was All My Loving in Canada, and that sold over 300,000 copies in Canada. So that's your equivalent. I think in the States, um, you you were selling something like 7 million copies of uh, the Meet the Beatles album, according to Mm -hmm. the information. So... Shows you how small the Canadian market was relative to uh, to the United States. Well, what was the population in 1963-64? We were approaching 20 million. Huh. Yeah. And, and you were well over 200 million. So, you know, yeah. it's a factor of 10. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so on wow. to... Who wants to pick up, Ken or Al? I'll, I'll pick up because okay. I can kind of segue from what you were saying, Alan. <laughs> uh, because <clears throat> when you m- were mentioning uh, the fact that copies of particularly the rollover Beethoven, uh, Please Mr. Postman single um, had, had made their way to New York, uh, I think actually even before that happened, this was in February – uh, radio stations, because of the fact that at that point they were, you know, looking to get their hands on any any scrap of Beatles music, uh, actually had gotten imported copies of that single and were playing it. And uh, and in fact, when when the Beatles played the Washington Coliseum, their you know their first actual live concert in the U.S., they opened the show with "Roll Over Beethoven." Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. So it was it was popular. Popular. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I did. I since I published the Red Book, I've actually come up with further information that suggests that Canada tried to get the Beatles. You know, when you talked about Washington, Canada tried to get the Beatles concert for that visit, and obviously, uh, the States was the bigger target for the Beatles. And where they talked about it, nothing was ever finalized. Obviously, after the Sullivan Show, everything changed. Right. But that summer, when they did come back for their first North American tour, they did do three shows in uh, oh. in Canada. Yep. And uh, yeah, Vancouver was was on August the 18th, right. uh, August the 22nd of 64. Right. And in Toronto was September 7th and Montreal, September the 8th. And they had big problems in Vancouver with security. They were using fencing that you would normally use for cattle and, and livestock and <laughs> hit the knock that over. And the Beatles were lucky to escape by running off the field. Uh, and Mal Evans, their uh, roadie, was able to you know protect the Beatles. But they never went back to Vancouver. They only had one show. They didn't sell out that show. And I think it was just, again, you know, if you had the choice after, you know, when you were planning to come back, you only wanted to go back to the cities where you could get like real traction and security as well to go with it. Mm. Uh, Toronto had good security. Montreal, uh, unfortunately, there was a uh, you know an English French thing happening, and sure. uh, the uh, separatist people felt that Ringo was somehow identified with this uh, English problem that they had in Quebec, and there were death threats placed on Ringo. Really. And, mm. Wow, the, the police had to provide extra security, 
and the entire time that that they were there, they were only there for ten hours. Uh, Ringo was really, really worried about his his life. And uh, at the very on the same day, there was a hurricane bearing down on uh, on Florida, Jacksonville, right. their next destination. So they chose to get the heck out of Montreal and head right down to Jacksonville, where I think they had a day or two to rest before their show in Jacksonville. But they never went back to Montreal. They never went back to Vancouver. But Toronto, Toronto, because of that fan club connection I mentioned with with so many fans, they had two concerts in each year, 64, 65, 66. And I believe Maple Leaf Gardens holds the record for the most number of North American Beatles concerts at one venue, Hmm. which would be sick. There's a great... uh soundboard recording of that Vancouver show too um, right that's well, been it's, it's floating actually, around on it's actually probably the best documented Beatles concert uh, because because apart yeah. from the the concert you've got all of the backstage stuff with the journalists covering it and you've got the right. press conference and it's it's really a hoot you know and a, and a little uh, clip of that even made eight days a week mm-hmm. it did it did uh, the gentleman's name was Jack Cullen, and he yes. was very clever. He had a Saturday night show, and he chose to have his show uh, at the Empire Stadium, and he basically allowed the audio to just flood into his show, and that's how that recording came. I actually am very fortunate. I own an acetate of that show. It's been bootlegged, of course. Many. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> We we know that well. <laughs> uh, Vancouver was uh, in the book. I've got, I've got a great story about you know them landing and and uh, getting cheeseburgers at a certain drive-in <laughs> restaurant. And Ringo, you know, as ever, didn't want any onions on his cheeseburger. And had right, to of course, <laughs> and that got into the papers. But. It got mentioned in the press conference too. I think it was, so, yes, so, yeah. <laughs> they, that's the great thing about that bootleg. You hear them interviewing some little kid who saw them at the getting the hamburgers, right. and then well, yeah, later that's... on they turn up for the press conference, and one of the journalists says, "We hear you had <laughs> twenty five cent hamburgers or something." And the Beatles are that... really like, "What? What the hell is going on here?" Yeah. <laughs> It made the front page. The really sad thing about Vancouver was that our uh, national broadcaster, CBC, uh, invested a lot of money to film the entire concert in color. So the entire show was filmed in beautiful color, and it was all done on brand new equipment, stories in the book. And uh, at the end of the day, one of the uh, CBC executives wanted to impress his girlfriend and invited her up to the room to watch this concert in color. And they watched this concert in color, but they didn't realize, because it was new equipment, while they were watching it, they were erasing it. Oh, Oh, my God. Firing squad. Yeah, Yeah, really. (laughs) Imagine, okay, he probably had a nice time for a couple of hours, but... uh, (laughs) I think he got into trouble after that. Mm -hmm. I would say so. Uh, Oh, my God. What a great story. Yeah. Oh, God. That's terrible. Oh, Oh, bad. So so I think there there is recently some color footage has surfaced from the Montreal show. Uh, I believe 10 minutes worth, and that's coming up for auction soon. And I took a look at it. The quality is very good. I am aware of some excellent footage from the Toronto 64 shows and uh all of this is coming out it's wonderful and i think eventually uh with such interest in in the recent film eight days a week i think mm-hmm. people are are more interested in in seeing some of the video they haven't seen before mm-hmm. right oh, i know absolutely. that toronto toronto audio was uh auctioned several years ago and that included all the opening acts as i recall yes remember that yep the 66 tape has has the remains it has uh uh the circle and some other acts of the mm-hmm. run i guess did you hear um, it there. yes um, Is it I, a- I actually had excerpts of it on the abbey road website way back when because the auctioneer let me preview it and uh it sounded as i recall um uh, like an audience recording is that is that right pierce yeah, it's an audience recording. The, the government of Canada was interested in buying that recording, and, and I helped them with that. In the end, as you say, it's an audience recording, 
uh, it's it's not something that Apple could really market. It's mm-hmm. not good enough quality. But a few years ago, I was lucky enough in doing the research for the book to uh, discover a, a really good recording of the 65 show in Toronto. And it has the opening act, Sounds Incorporated, and Brenda Holloway and mm-hmm. the others, uh, plus the full Beatles show. Apple is interested in in uh, doing something with it, but at this time, all they've done is listen to it. They haven't actually uh, made any decision. But I hope that someday, you know, for me, I've I've heard it, and I'd say the guitar work by George is one of the best that you're going to hear. It's wow. not great quality, but the good news is that it was done off the soundboard, so it wasn't done out in the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, it would need some work. And again, you know, if, if you do anything with Apple, it has to be approved, authorized and, and all those other good things that they do. They don't want to put out anything that's substandard, but it's good to know it exists. You know? Well, that's interesting that they're actually taking an interest in concerts. That's something that I think we've talked about before. And, and that's I think is that the first time we've heard they've actually taken an interest in uh, in, in a concert that hasn't been out before? I think it is. Well, yeah. I don't know. I, I, all the things we hear about them thinking about are things that have been around. Um, yeah. But, exactly. but this, a, a, a soundboard, uh, yeah, that's that's very tantalizing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maple Leaf Gardens is still up, right? Yes, it's still up. And we had, um, last summer, we had a 50th anniversary concert. And they, a group, you know, a cover band, obviously, played the whole set list. It, and it was sold out. It, you know, there's so many Beatles fans <laughs> up here. Um, and for me, I, I love it. I, uh, I, The city of Toronto did a Beatles museum exhibit last year. They asked me to be a guest curator. And I, I was just thrilled because I got access to so many archives uh, that I wouldn't normally have had access to. So, you know television archives, radio archives, newspaper stuff, mm. and photographers, which which I really enjoy. And I did a series of walks. So I, I'm doing them again this year. So I walk anybody that's interested from Maple Leaf Gardens down to the King Edward Hotel, and we tell stories. And it's a lot of fun. And a Beatles stayed at that same hotel for three years, same room. And the stuff that the walls could tell if they could talk would be <laughs> amazing. But um, I'll tell you, just from doing the walks, I get people who come along on the walks who were at these shows who have stories. And it's just always a learning experience for me. I love mm-hmm. it. I guess it's safe to assume you never went to any of the Beatles concerts, right? I didn't live in Toronto then, and I wish I had, but um, I was lucky, as I mentioned at the beginning. I lived in England in 63. I was at school. I saw them on television at the very beginning of what they were doing. I, I'm pretty sure they never played Love Me Do on television, but I did see them do Please Please Me on the, uh, I think it was Thank Your Lucky Stars. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and you it, also say in your book that you saw them on Jukebox Jury. That probably, yep, exactly. I, I was very fortunate. We moved back here in August of 63. Uh, my brother had the album, and believe it or not, he, he had the smarts to buy it in stereo and, and the singles. So I could listen to every, and I guess I'm, I'm lucky in that I listened to everything the way it was released in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, which not many Canadians can say. Mm. Yeah, really. When's the uh, Blue Book coming out, uh, Pierce? Oh, gosh. You know, you can, you can only imagine that the Blue Book covers all this amazing stuff, including the Lennon visits to Toronto. That's right. Wow. Uh, yeah. in. It covers, uh, obviously, all the releases, the music. Uh, I got so much material. It's like a fire hose of material. I can't see myself having it done for another year or two. Even though I thought I had a lot of the research done, I've, I've, uh, I've just been blown away by how much stuff there is. So when it's all said and done, the blue book and the red book will be, you know, a, a two two volume package, mm-hmm. and the book will also have rare recordings on it uh, as as an audio disc and and maybe even some video this time. Hmm. Um, mm. I don't know. 
I don't think any of you has listened to the CD yet, but there was a Canadian DJ who worked for Radio Luxembourg in the 50s, David Gell, and I was so fortunate I tracked him down, and David now lives here in Calgary, and he kindly recorded an introduction to the audio CD, and David, you'd never heard of him, but he was a, a DJ at Radio Luxembourg. He was the first guy to play uh, an Elvis Presley record in Europe. And, and when John Lennon met him, he, he basically bowed down to his feet and said, you were the <laughs> that got me into rock and roll. And here's this, this man who's now well into his mid to late 80s out in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, just a very kind man and uh, part of the little Canadian story. Hmm. What else is on the CD? Uh, the CD has some of uh, the 65 concert that I mentioned. It's got the warm up. It's got a lot of Tony Barrow um, from the press conference that's never been released before. Uh, there are interviews with the fan club, uh, well, woman, was girl, Trudy Metcalf, who started the, the first Canadian fan club, uh, some of her stories. There are all of the original 1963 radio news reports about the Beatles oh, wow. from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So. Anything I could find, basically, that would... And then I had to jam it into a one-hour disc. But there are 37 tracks uh -huh. and all, all pretty historic stuff. And the, I was able to find a, an air check of a Chum, Chum Toronto, where they were playing a brand new record, which was, uh, which was I Want to Hold Your Hand. But they weren't playing the A side. They, they preferred the B side in Toronto. They were playing... I saw her standing there. So it's kind of funny how Canadians interpreted, you know, an A side to a B side huh. in, in 1964. It was very, very little bit different from what you had in the States. So even in Canada, then, I saw her standing there was the B side of I Want to Hold Your Hand, as opposed to this boy, which was the B side in England. Yes. Yep. Uh -huh. it, there was a, a, a big mandate that came down from... Uh, Alan Livingston in Los Angeles right. to, to uh, the, the executives in Toronto said, OK, from here on in, you're not issuing your own Beatles stuff anymore. You're going to do it our way. Uh -huh. And that was fair from, a, you know, sending masters around and things like that. So after the first three Canadian albums, in fact, our third album was called Long Tall Sally, has a cover that looks just like your second album. But we couldn't call it the second album because it wasn't the second album. It was right. the third. So, <laughs> I think, ideally, if they called it the Beatles' third album and it had the same cover as the one called the second album, that would have really messed things up. But yeah. uh, mm -hmm. they chose to, to uh, issue tracks that weren't uh, necessarily available yet in Canada, but because Canada already issued everything, there was only basically two new tracks on the album. Mm, right. One was Misery and, uh, I guess, uh, Long Tall Sally from the EP. So it didn't sell so well, uh, mm. typically, because the second album in the States was being imported in, in the thousands into Canada because it was a new Beatle record, and it was released before Long Tall Sally. So by the time Long Tall Sally came out, uh, there was nothing new there, really, and uh, it didn't do so well. And after that, Capitol in Los Angeles said, from here on in, it's going to be our catalog, and that's what you're going to issue. So uh, starting with something new, everything was the same, pretty much, uh, right up and until Let It Be. That's too bad. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about Paul White and his importance in this whole story? Because... It really is remarkable when you think about it. He had such belief in the Beatles early on. And mm -hmm. um, he was pushing all the singles and even sending out tip sheets to radio stations, advising them to, to listen to this band. And yeah. also, why do you think that in Canada they were so slow to pick up on the Beatles, just like here in America? Well, I, I believe it's for one reason. Um, nobody could see the Beatles uh, in 1963 on television in Canada. And very few kids had access to the magazines like Melody Maker or New Musical Express. They were sold mm. here, but they generally they were sold at uh, newspaper stands, but they were they were they always lagged by a few weeks or maybe even a month. 
So there were a few hip kids that that would pick up these magazines. Generally, they were kids who were playing in in uh, guitar based bands. Uh, they were interested in what was happening in England. Cliff Richard was a big seller here in Canada. Didn't do so much in the States. So there was a general interest in what was happening because a lot of people had family in the UK of what was happening in the pop charts of the NME and the Melody Makers. So I think that had a lot to do with, you know, the early birds. Uh, they couldn't see, you know, the hair. Once they saw the hair... And once these the news stories that I mentioned that are on the CD, once the news started picking up on these four guys with this really long hair, um, <laughs> kids thought, well, it's kind of a form of rebellion. And it's funny, I have a whole chapter in the book on merchandise um, that was sold in Canada around the Beatles. And the very first item that was for sale up here was a Beatle wig. And there were kids as early as uh, November 1963 wearing these imported uh, Beatles wigs from England. Uh, wow. The week before Ed Sullivan, they were selling for twenty nine ninety five, which was a crazy expensive wow. amount of money. And within yeah. two weeks after Ed Sullivan, they were down to about $2.99. So uh, <laughs> it's supply and demand. You know, there's some really good stories in the book about the merchandising and what products were sold in the States versus what was sold in Canada. So some of the people I've talked to down in the States who specialize in Beatles memorabilia uh, always kind of email me or contact me because they'll come up with something that looks identical to what you have in the U.S., but it says on it somewhere made in Canada. And we always try to figure out, you know, how soon did we get it? Did we have it first? Did they have it first down there? It's There's combs. There's... Um, all of that stuff that was sold up here. Wallpaper was shipped from England, Montreal in February of 63. I think an entire shipload wow. wallpaper, and that ended up everywhere, the Beatles wallpaper. Uh, so I have a chapter on that, all of the promotional stuff that Capital Records of Canada put together to promote the records. But I'm, I want to answer your question about Paul White. Paul White was operating on his own. He had two hats. He was an a and guy who had to listen to the new stuff. He was also head of promotion. So usually in the States, they would have one person looking after a and and another department looking after promotion. But Paul did both. So to your point about him sending out the tip sheets, he called it a sizzle sheet. He would publish that every Friday. Uh, he would put on his comments about what he recommended a radio station should plug from capital so back then you know radio stations would would be getting free records from capital they'd be getting free records from columbia etc cetera, etc cetera. and they felt duty bound to plug a couple of their records every week because they were getting them for free if they didn't plug them uh they weren't likely to get any more uh free records so paul was very good at, at writing comments in his sizzle sheet those sizzle sheets went out to about 200 radio stations, and his, uh, his background was journalism. So he had worked in England for a couple of newspapers. So he was very good with his writing skills, and he had like a sense of humor, so you know, an English sense of humor. So I think he was able to combine some nice marketing and uh, music commentary to his sizzle sheets, and people liked getting those. It was, it was, again, it was a free thing they got from Capitol Records. Mm. But you're saying you think that because the Beatles were in the news, once the once Canadians saw them on television, you mm -hmm. know, that that was that was one of the biggest reasons why they caught on more so than than the record promotion. Uh, I, I think it was, you know, the fan club uh, doing a lot of work to mm. get the Beatles word out there and Chum Chum was the largest station in Toronto. They ended up bankrolling the Beatles fan club. And in just before Christmas of 63, they had Trudy Metcalf on the radio for a whole hour and playing cuts from, you know, the Beatles album, Beatlemania, as well as some of the, uh, the other uh, records that were available. And she was talking about them coming to Ed Sullivan then. So she was telling, you know, 
kids on the radio, okay, the Beatles are coming to Sullivan on February the 9th, and this is on like December the 23rd. So Canadian kids had a lot of information via Chum, and Chum was was strong on promoting uh, the fan club because they thought the Beatles were going to be big, and it was Chum that actually paid for their airline tickets to New York. It was Brian Somerville who worked for Brian Epstein who right. brought you know who brought the uh, the girls down to New York to thank yeah. them for all the work that they did to get. And when John Lennon met Trudy Metcalf again, he got down on his knees and he said, "You know, I want to thank you for all that you did to get us going here." But obviously not in the states. Montreal had a fan club. Unfortunately, the girl who started that fan club was kind of eclipsed by the Toronto fan club to a degree in that mm -hmm. she didn't get invited down to New York. It was the girl from Toronto. So the fan club had a lot to do with it. The radio station had a lot to do with it. Uh, I wouldn't say magazine so much, but we had one writer up here named Sandy Gardner who wrote for the Ottawa Journal, and he was plugging Beatles records right from Love Me Do. So the first written review of a Beatles record I tracked down was March 3rd or March 4th of 1963. Uh, he reviewed Love Me Do for the Ottawa Journal in their weekly pop column. And he would go on and re and he would kept hyping and hyping and hyping the Beatles. And he would offer 25 copies of the next Beatles single for a contest. And uh, Sandy uh, got his... Uh, is if, if you know the first Canadian album, there are four sort of mm. tabloid style quotes on the front cover. Yes. Okay. So yes. Sand got his reward. They put his quote at the top. Uh, Sandy Gardner talked yeah. about how it was a disease infected kids across Canada. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it was there was a, a couple of journalists that that were plugging the Beatles again. I think seeing the cover of Beatlemania, seeing that album, obviously sparked a lot of interest in kids because finally they could see what they looked like visually with the hair. Mm -hmm. And the hair, you know, four kids with long hair, nobody else looked like that at that time. So I think it was a, a rebellion. It was a new thing. And all around uh, Canada in December of 63, I know a lot of kids got that album as a gift in December of 63, it was, it was something that was hotter than hot. RCA Victor was pressing Elvis's fun in Acapulco in the final week of November of 63. Uh, the very weekend that, that Kennedy was assassinated, you know, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th of November, RCA Victor was in overdrive pressing copies of Beatlemania. They had Initially, I believe, 25, and then it was amped up to 50,000 copies of that album pressed for the Christmas market. Hmm. Yeah, I think I may yeah. have told you this, uh, this story, Piers, but sometime in 64, I walked into a record store in Hackensack, New Jersey, second week in a row of gotten Hackensack in <laughs> and, and saw a copy of this, of this album called mm -hmm. Beatlemania with the Beatles, you know, with the, you know, the, the famous, uh, the, the famous Robert Freeman, uh, photograph on the cover, but it wasn't the, it wasn't meet the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And, and then when I looked at it, it was, you know, I realized that it was, and I, this is before I had gotten the Beatles second out, the American Beatles second album. And so I realized that it was, you know, it was, it was different from what we had, uh, what we had here. And so I got it and brought it home and it, and it also sounded very different from, uh, from, well, for me, it, well, yeah, actually even from both, both Meet the Beatles and the Beatles second album, because there wasn't all of the reverb. Uh, added to it and all, uh, you know, it sounded more more natural. Well, th there's a couple of things to pick up on there. That album has seven tracks on each side, just like a, a regular yep. British release of that mm -hmm. at the time. Paul White arranged to have the master tape flown over on, uh, I think it was a Monday. The, it was the week before Kennedy was assassinated. He decided to go with the the, uh, the the full release of an album, 
which was pretty gutsy for him, considering, you know, She Loves You hadn't quite taken off yet, but he was doing it based on what he read in, in the British press about Beatlemania, and I tie it back to the uh, CBC radio reports that were on the radio every other day here about Beatlemania in October and November of 63. So he heard about it, and he was getting a lot of pressure from kids, the fan club, to put the album out. And the only difference, as I mentioned before, they, they splashed the word Beatlemania on the top, right. and they heard the tabloid quotes. CA Victor had a very good reputation for pressing vinyl records. Uh, they'd opened their plant in 1953, just in front of the Elvis Presley phenomenon. So they had their plant running like a Swiss watch, and they were able to take the outsourcing business of Capital Records of Canada, because Capital didn't press their own records up here. They relied on an agreement with RCA Victor, and their quality was very high, and they also had a very good reputation for being able to get records shipped anywhere in Canada within, I think, 36 to 48 hours, you know, from from manufacture. So they, they were dealing with a big space across Canada, and they were able to manage it just in front of that Christmas, uh, you know, big demand back for records. Yeah, the rush. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it actually went head to head with Elvis's fun in Acapulco for, for the <laughs> So you had RCA getting paid to do both, you know, whatever rate they were getting to press records. Visually, if you put the two records side by side, one looks older and one looks brand new. Exciting. Yeah. Mm. The, the one thing, you know, in all your comments, Pierce, is how far ahead Canada was. Uh, in America, uh, of America, uh, in with the Beatles, it, it, it's it's a, it's incredible. I mean that they were that far ahead, you know. Uh, uh, well, it, I, I I also get into something you might be interested in that George Harrison had family here in Canada. Oh right. And, uh, uh, his sister Louise, who I know some of you met through the the fest and things like mm -hmm. that. Yep. She, she uh, and her husband emigrated to Canada in 1956. He was a mining engineer. They lived in northern Ontario, a place called Virginia Town. George would write her postcards starting literally in the summer of 56. He'd write her things like, uh, Louise, I'm learning to play the guitar. A couple of months later, Louise, I've joined a band called the Quarrymen. Uh, <laughs> a month later, Louise, I'm, I'm going to Germany, you know, that type of thing. And... Uh, Louise's mother, obviously George's mother, came out to visit, and George asked his uh, mother when she was out here to get him a pair of cowboy boots, which she brought back to him, and then he wore in Hamburg, and the other three Beatles saw those boots and said, oh, we've got to have those, so they had them in Hamburg, but uh, there was a nice little family connection in that George also had an aunt and uncle in Toronto, uh, they... Uh, Edmund French was his name, Uncle Edmund, and Mimi, Mimi, his wife, they had two kids. And when when George came to uh, play in Toronto, of course, all the family came to, to uh, visit him at the hotel. Uh, so George had family, and believe it or not, John Lennon's girlfriend, Cynthia, her mother didn't really approve of John Lennon for a number of reasons, and... Uh, mm came over to Toronto in 1961 to, to, to work as a nanny. And she would she would be based here until 1963 uh, when, of course, John was a world-famous Beatle. She would move back to Liverpool. And uh, so they had Canadian connections. Funnily enough, when, when the two girls went to uh, New York, they tried to get into, the fan club girls tried to get into the Ed Sullivan show. They were outside and they were chatting with this woman from England named Cynthia. And it turned out that Cynthia couldn't get into the Ed Sullivan show because nobody believed that John <laughs> Lennon. Uh, <laughs> wow. Had a wonderful conversation, which is documented in the book, lasted like half an hour. And Cynthia knew all about Toronto because of her mother being there for the previous two years. So it's kind of a little side story. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. George had said in one of his his postcards that he would would have wanted to emigrate to Canada, and of course there wouldn't have been any Beatles if that had happened. I don't think so, but mm, a right. little history there. So again, I think that really reflects the Canadian people traffic between England and Canada at the time. There was a lot of people getting jobs in Canada in the mining industry or 
or the other industries that were here. You're going to be at the fest in, in, New, in New Jersey. All right. Excited. And uh, but uh, people who aren't going to be there that are interested in your book, how can they get it? Well, uh, if you go to the website, it's uh, the Beatles in Canada dot com. The only books that are left are out of the UK and the link that's on the website will direct you to a page and the shipping is is currently free. So when you get the free shipping, the price of the book is the same. In fact, it's probably a little cheaper now because of the exchange rate. You can order it. I know the, the people that I've talked to lately that have ordered it who are based in the States have ordered it from the UK. They get the book within maybe seven or eight days uh, and they don't pay for the delivery. Okay. Nice. Okay. But I will have some books at the fest. I've only got six hardcover books left. These are all signed by Paul White and Mark Lewison and myself. And they're the last of the, the 200 hardcover books I did. And, uh, I'm going to have those at the table, plus a number of soft cover books that were left over from the Chicago Fest from last August. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Piers. That's been this has been great. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've really enjoyed hearing all the stuff that that uh, I mean, well, some of the stuff is just amazing. Like all I right. said at the beginning, Canada's Beatles story is is different, but it is so similar. So. Same record company, Capitol Records, the same, you know, Ed Sullivan having the same impact on Canadians because the Ed Sullivan show was broadcast on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. A lot of it's similar. And, and, and obviously between 63 and 64, the girls went wild over the Beatles. And then later on, it was the guys that got into the music. So, hmm. you know, very similar. Demographics are similar. Language is similar. Similar story. But different. Well, thank you very much, Pierce. This has been mm-hmm. very, very enlightening. Very enlightening. Well, thank um, you for the opportunity. We'd love to hear from you out there uh, what you thought of this show or our other shows. And you can write to us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can also contact us on Facebook at things we said today, Beatles radio fans. You can contact each of us on our personal pages. My email is beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I'm going to run around the table. Piers, first of all, how can people get a hold of you? Well, it's the beatlesincanada.com website, and my email address is on the website. So send me an email. I'd be happy to uh, respond to anyone who's interested in the book. And again, I also mentioned the, the blue book is is in the works and I'm happy to solicit any stories or things that people think I should include. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me, let's go around the table. Um, uh, Ken, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, my email address is every little thing at att.net. You can always visit my website, which is Ken Michaelsradio.com. Very quickly. I just want to plug two things. My latest uh, syndicated show for every little thing is an all George Harrison special for his birthday. And um, right now I have 24 stations carrying the show. If you want to know where you can hear it, you can go to my every little thing page on the website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. I also want to say that I just recently was a guest on a Paul McCartney podcast, which is called Two Legs. <laughs> it's a brand new show, and it's hosted by Tom Hunyadi and David Gargolino who are fans of both this show and Every Little Thing. They listen to this show all the time. And um, so we talk about uh, the first part of Paul McCartney's solo career, the singles that came out from 1971 through 74. And we talk about my history in radio with Every Little Thing. And we talk a bit about this show, too. So if you want to listen to that program, it's going to be posted. uh, They're saying hopefully this Friday, which is February 24th, and it's on podbean.com, just like we are. So if you go to podbean.com and you type in Paul McCartney, you'll see their show there. Again, it's called Two Legs. Okay? Okay. Cool. Thank you, Ken. Uh, mm-hmm. Al? 
Contact wise, it's uh, easy. Uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, uh, on Twitter at ASUSS49 or through www.beetlefan.com. And I'll put in two very quick uh, plugs myself because last week I did uh, did a, um, an interview or uh, Steve Ludwig did an interview with me which oh. actually ran um, earlier on this evening that we're, that we're recording this but it will be available uh, on there on uh, the on Steve's Planet Ludwig uh, archive uh, later on this week and also uh, this past Friday, uh, Alan Haber and I did another one of our sessions of what uh, what Alan calls two two owls talk tunes. <laughs> and uh, actually, we'll be doing another one later this week. And I believe uh, that'll be uh, both of those will be running very soon on uh, Alan Haber's Pure Pop Radio. Okay, uh, very good, um, Alan. Okay, you can um, reach me on Facebook at um, Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. I also read the emails that come in on the Things We Said Today radio show Gmail account. And um, thanks to uh, in the last week, we've actually had quite a few, um, particularly about the the Denny Sywell show. Um, so thanks for your comments about that. Mm. Yes. And uh, otherwise, I have nothing to plug particularly, having already mentioned my books earlier in the show. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't mention my book, uh, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. It's on Amazon and and elsewhere. Uh, very cheap ebook. Um, I guess that's about it, guys. I think we've we've hit the end of another great week. Thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you for your comments thank you for liking us thank you for everything i'm uh, thank you for being there this is steve marinucci speaking for alan cozen ken michaels al sussman and piers hemmingson saying thanks for listening and we will see you next time mm-hmm.